Happy New Year to everyone who tunes into the Art of the Matter. Thanks for joining me. I'm a little out of sync with the lectionary reading for this weekend because I was focusing on January 6th, the 12th day of Christmas, otherwise known as the Epiphany, when the three wise men, or Magi, also known as the Three Kings, followed a star they had seen in the east, probably in modern-day Iran, many weeks earlier, until it led them to the place where Jesus lay, a newly born child, whom their calculations told them was destined to be king of the Jews. They'd come to worship and pay him homage with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, as it tells us in Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I, too, may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. It's because three distinct gifts are mentioned that people have assumed that there were three wise men. The Bible doesn't tell us how many there were, and it doesn't call them kings. But many traditions have grown up around them, and sometime around the 8th century, they were given names and assigned to the three ages of man. Caspar or Gaspar, the eldest, Melchior, who was middle-aged, and Balthazar, the youngest. According to Western church tradition, Balthazar is often represented as a king of Arabia or Ethiopia, and is therefore frequently depicted with dark skin. Melchior was thought to be a king of Persia, modern-day Iran, and Gaspar as king of India. The fact that early on they were called Magi indicates that they may have been priests of Zoroastrianism. Hugo van der Goes's Adoration of the Magi from 1470, which you're looking at right now, once formed the central panel of a much larger altarpiece, whose side panels have since disappeared, and which has been cut off at the top, where we see the purple and yellow folds of angels' gowns suspended above the heads of Mary and Jesus. Van der Goes was a Netherlandish painter, very much in the school of Van Eck, and he makes use of oil paints to render every object, animal, vegetable, mineral, with the greatest precision. Mary, Joseph, and the baby have taken refuge in what remains of a palatial Roman ruin in the rolling countryside, which we glimpse through the opening at the back and side of this edifice. At the back, we see that some shepherds have left their flocks in order to see the baby the angels told them was Christ the Lord. And out of the left break in the wall, Beyond the beautiful irises, we see a town and the rest of the three wise men's entourage making its way to the shelter 
where the Magi and the Holy Family are gathered. All of our attention is drawn to the vision, the showing forth or epiphany of the Christ child, as he is revealed for the first time to the world outside of his family, indeed revealed to the world of the Gentiles. John Gassert, otherwise known as Mabuz because of the region where he was from, drew heavily on van der Goes's painting of the Adoration of the Three Kings to create his own image of it. The Mother Mary and Jesus are similar in style to that of van der Goes, and he expanded on van der Goes's idea of showing broken walls opening out into towns and fields, revealing a far distant town through the arch at the back, with a background of gloriously blue sky stretching from left to right, filled with angels, and above them, the star of Bethlehem and the dove of the Holy Spirit hovering just below. The entourage of the Magi stretches to the hills on the right side of the picture. Again, the focus of our attention is drawn to Mary and the tiny child on her lap, the tiny child who tentatively reaches out to hold a gold coin, almost like a communion wafer, a cupful of coins being presented to Jesus by the eldest Magus, Gaspar. At the foot of Mary, we see the exquisitely rendered golden scepter of Caspar, as well as his hat and the golden cover of the cup containing the golden coins. A perfect still life within the larger painting. No detail is too small as to be unworthy of attention. Even the cracked tiles and the small plants springing up between them are rendered with extravagant, painstaking care. This attention to small things makes a larger point. As one writer has put it, this is not a flashy event. Matthew's point is the hiddenness of Christ, the small and often unnoticed ways God enters our lives in epiphanies large and small. The writer goes on, this hiddenness is a kind of divine signature. Instead of showing forth conspicuously at the Jerusalem temple, God slips into the world by way of a poor family under the heavy thumb of Roman taxation policy in a backwater town. And instead of showing forth to a crowd of supposed insiders, God will be noticed first by strangers, wise ones come from the east, as well as lowly shepherds. God does indeed show forth, but in a hidden way. Three technical features need to be mentioned here. First of all, the plunging perspective of Gossart's work was probably modeled on a widely circulated print by Martin Schongauer, who used a very similar plunging perspective line in his earlier scene of the Nativity to draw our eyes to Mary, whose gaze then directs our eyes to behold the tiny child at her feet. And the dog, we see in the left foreground gnawing a bone, is a direct borrowing from Shangauer's print of the Adoration of the Magi. But if we focus on the dog and flip him around, we have a perfect match. Shangauer's print also influenced Gossart's work in other ways, but I think the point is clear without, over, without overloading you with a blizzard of details. As for the second dog, in the right foreground, we see that Gossert was drawing inspiration from Albrecht Dürer's print of Saint Eustache from some 10 years before. Here is Dürer's pooch, and we can see the resemblance when they are placed side by side. Among other things, this tells us how the revolution in printmaking helped disseminate an artist's work far and wide, providing a very lucrative source of income for the artist himself, as well as inspiration for other artists who might be very far removed from the original artist in space 
and in time. Shifting gears here, I'd like to show you one last scene of the Adoration of the Magi, which is utterly different in character, but it's one that has had a profound influence on me. That is this adoration scene by the Italian Florentine artist Sandro Botticelli, painted in 1475, about the same time that Schongauer, the northern Netherlandish painter and engraver, made the adoration scene we looked at a moment ago. When I was studying art history at L'Ecole du Louvre, the art history school of the Louvre Museum, this painting was the subject of careful analysis. You'll notice that our eyes are not immediately drawn to Mary and the infant Jesus, who, though very present, seemed somewhat aloof and removed from the animated and colorful crowd of people below. And no doubt, that's what the patron who commissioned this work desired. The patron was Gaspare Lamy, whose cameo appearance features him looking out at the viewer and pointing to himself as the man who financed the work to grace the chapel of the Epiphany in one of Florence's most famous churches, Santa Maria Novella. The painter himself, Sandro Botticelli, is also featured in a rather supercilious self-portrait on the right, standing somewhat apart and looking directly at us as if to dare us to say anything against the scene he has created, because it was quite a scene. You see, Gaspare Lamy had commissioned this work of art in order to curry favor with the all-powerful ruling family of Florence at that time, the Medici, and all the most important members of that family, as well as their circle of friends and courtiers, are included. Naturally, I suppose, the roles of the three wise men, or kings, are played by Medici rulers. Cosimo, the one who put the Medici bank on the map, so to speak, he plays the role of the eldest Magus and is kneeling at the feet of Christ and Mary, receiving a blessing from Jesus' tiny raised hand. Below him, and in the center foreground, wearing a red cape, is Cosimo's son, Piero, who plays the role of Melchior, the middle-aged Magus. And on the right is his brother, Giovanni, playing the part of the youngest Magus, Balthazar, notably without dark skin. All three of these Medici rulers, Cosimo, Piero, and Giovanni, were dead by the time this picture was painted. Florence was under the powerful rule now of Piero's son, Lorenzo de' Medici, the great patron of the arts and master of propaganda, and featured here on the left in a rather proud, somewhat haughty posture. His brother, Giuliano, is on the right, looking down and seemingly lost in thought. All the other people in the picture were tied in some way to the court of Lorenzo de' Medici in Florence philosophers, diplomats, agents for the International Bank, and so on. What grabbed my attention during the lecture at the Louvre's School of Art History was hearing that the Medici family, under Cosimo the Elder's leadership, had reactivated a previously defunct confraternity, a special kind of club for the initiated, if you will, dedicated to the veneration of the three magi. Epiphany, obviously, would be the most important day of the year for this group, and once every five years there would be a huge celebration of this holy day in the church calendar, with a special parade route marked out through the city stopping at its most important landmarks. And during this time, the Medici themselves would ride forth as the three Magi, dressed in resplendent attire, surrounded by their entourage of courtiers, and receiving the adulation of the assembled crowds at each stop along the way. That's pretty powerful pageantry, 
the city's most illustrious family, on one of the most important religious holy days of the year, assuming the key role of the three wise men, or kings, displaying themselves in their most glorious raiment for all to see and admire. Faith, piety, power, riches, wisdom, royalty, pomp, and circumstance. The Medici family had it all, or at least that was the message that they wanted to convey. And they accomplished that not just through the public display of the confraternity of the three magi, but through art as well. No doubt they were thrilled to see that one of their supporters had commissioned this work to flatter members of their family, past and present. They themselves commissioned a similar work by another Florentine artist, Benozzo Gozzoli, to adorn a magnificent chapel in their personal residence in Florence. A visitor, upon entering, would be ushered through the chapel, which shows a vast procession on three walls of the three magi and their retinue. And every insignia, every adornment on the horses and the livery of the servants, as well as on the floor tiles and wall decorations, bears the signs and symbols of the Medici family. Cosimo, Piero, and the young Lorenzo are prominently featured. Lorenzo here appearing as the youngest king, splendidly attired. The Medici sponsored many well-known artists, Botticelli, Filippo Lippi, Michelangelo, Donatello, among others. And their principal task was to bring glory to the Medici name through the vehicle of art. So, We've looked at the epiphany from several different artistic points of view. In some cases, the goal of the artist is to glorify the religious subject, the first revealing of Christ to the world in the most humble of circumstances. This is the hidden epiphany, if you will, the Messiah being revealed in a tumble-down ruin to a small group of strangers. The other way of painting the scene brings honor to the patron or to the people the patron wanted to glorify, in this case, the Medici. Art in the service of religious faith can be put to many uses and abuses, and it's up to you, the viewer, to discern what agenda, if any, the artist had in mind when he or she painted a work. In any case, I hope you enjoy many hidden revelations of the Lord during this special season of the church. The prophet Zechariah admonishes us not to despise the day of small things. So be on the lookout for the Lord's appearance where you least expect him, where there's no fanfare or grandiose spectacle, but just the small hidden gleam of the Holy Spirit's light in passing. God bless and see you soon.